Good evening, everybody. I'm giving us a little bit of time here for people to get into the room before I get started. I can see that you're coming in fast. It's looking great. All right, I'm going to get started here. Welcome to our final One Health seminar of the semester here at Delaware Valley University. I am Reg Hoyt. I am your moderator for this evening. Uh, and I'm sure that most of you have been here before, but for those of you who have not, uh, let me tell you a little bit about One Health. Well, One Health is a transdisciplinary systems approach to really working not only uh, at local levels, but all the way up to the global level. And, and for those of you who are from the community or had a little bit of time in your disciplines, uh, it may be easy for you to understand this, but for others, you know those silos that we all got trained in, we finally came to the conclusions that we really need to talk to others, that we need other disciplines to be able to address problems in the world. And frankly, we're all on this one ball together, uh, you know, this planet Earth, uh, and that we're interacting in different ways with plants and animals and the environment. And in turn, they're affecting us as well. And certainly uh, having a pandemic uh, that has been the full attention of all of us for quite some time now, we're well aware of the fact that we're kind of interacting with the natural world and the natural world is interacting with us. Well, here at DelVal, we've been working on this issue to try to incorporate it across all of our uh, departments for, well, six years now. Uh, and the way we've been approaching this is from three basic sides. One is education. And so uh, our DelVal experience too, which is our freshman class, one of our freshman classes, introduces the concept to everyone here at DelVal. Uh, and then in other classes across the, the curriculum, people are, are talking about how you address problems and that you need a transdisciplinary approach. Research is another component of this. And we're very lucky at Delaware Valley University that we've been about the land from the very beginning. Uh, when Rabbi Kroskoff founded DelVal, uh, he was looking at you know, learning through practice and practice really comes with working with each other. And uh, we're small enough that our silos, well, they don't exist quite as, as grandly as we see at large institutions and provide some unique opportunities for us to work together. And then finally, outreach. And that's what tonight is all about. Our seminar series is not only for our students, all of our students and our faculty, but also for all of those members of the community who tune in with us as well. Uh, it is our goal to bring all of us together to think about things that maybe we haven't thought about before and realize that we all need to work together to address the issues in our lives, whether it's locally or whether it's uh, regionally, nationally, or internationally. We're very fortunate that the Bucks County Audubon Society is co-sponsoring our evening tonight. And the executive director is Stacy Carpool, and she is here tonight to tell you a little bit about uh, Bucks County Audubon Society at Honey Hollow, uh, and to introduce our guest tonight, who I am extremely happy to have with us. Thank you for attending. Thank you so much, Reg, um, and thank you so much for, for having us. Um, as Reg said, my name is Stacy Carpool. I'm the executive director with Bucks County Audubon Society. Um, Bucks County Audubon Society is an environmental education center. We are located um, just outside of Peddler's Village um, in the New Hope Solberry area. So nice and close to everybody. Hopefully many of you have had an opportunity to come out, maybe hike the trails, maybe you've come out with a class to engage in a project with us. Um, it's a really, really fabulous place. We're all about connecting people to the natural world and hopefully inspiring everyone to become good stewards of the earth. We have tons of programs throughout the year, and we are also, I'm going to put this plug out there since we have a lot of students on tonight, um, we are soon going to be looking um, for a lot of extra interns um, and educators to help us um, next summer. So if you are interested in a potential summer position, um, definitely keep a lookout um, on our website. Um, those will probably be posted, I would guess, probably by the first of the year. So hopefully um, we can engage many of you um, out at our site and help, full, help with um, working with the children and working with on the property. So, so thank you so much. Um, 
And Reg, let me um, introduce the, um, our speaker tonight. <laughs> this is not my strongest suit, so we'll, we'll give this a try. Um, we are really, really excited. I have to admit, I saw this title. I'm just like, wow, this is someone really, really amazing. Um, so I really want to introduce you to Dr. Dr. Bennett, who's a professor and chair of sustainability science at McGill University, um, which is in Canada, which I did not know when I first started looking that up. <laughs> Um, and her work really focuses on the interactions among ecosystem services and how we can manage those interactions. She is a leader in this field, um, collaborating with um, multiple stakeholders in this. Okay, I'm gonna get this wrong. Is it ResNet, I believe? Um, which is a hundred plus person um, strategic network, which I think is amazing. Anytime you have that many people involved in something, it's just always amazing. Um, her most recent work focuses on radical transformative experiments in society which you can't get better than that. That just sounds amazing to me. Um, and she's also has had several fellowships, uh, many awards, and I love the fact that she has over 150 peer reviewed publications. So hopefully the students will all take that into, into consideration. That is really, really impressive. So we are so excited to have you with us tonight and I, I'm looking forward to learning so much from you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stacey. That was a very, it was a lovely and very generous uh, <laughs> introduction. So I really appreciate that. Um, and I am, I'm just thrilled to be here today as I was uh, when, when I was first contacted and sort of looking around about uh, the university and about One Health and, and seeing somebody else out there who does this transdisciplinary systems approach, it, that is really surprisingly um, rare. So it's really nice. And I, I feel like I've found like kindred spirits when I find someone or even a group of people even better who are thinking about things in this way. So what I'm gonna do uh, uh, today is sort of introduce you to ResNet, this project that uh, uh, I'm running now, and uh, I'm going to do that in sort of service of talking a little bit about uh, ecosystem services and about transdisciplinary science. Um, so what ResNet is, is it's a pan-Canadian, so cross-Canadian network that is um, designed to address multi-scale issues around ecosystem services. And we have three goals. So one is to answer stakeholder questions about land management and advance place-based transdisciplinary science. And that really emerged from a previous project that I worked on around where I live now, which is Montreal, kind of thinking, oh, we answered these questions that people really had about the landscape. Could we do the same around the country? Um, then second, to make inroads towards improving the scientific understanding of ecosystem services. And that goal kind of emerged from a workshop that had about two dozen of us outlining research goals. And that led to a paper that I published in 2015 that outlined next steps for ecosystem service research. And I'll get to that in more detail later, but we really wanted ResNet to try to answer some of those questions. And then finally, to use the results of one and two to contribute to some sort of national monitoring system uh, for, for Canada that we could answer decision makers' questions, reflect the latest understanding of ecosystem services and help Canada do a little bit better uh, job of ecosystem management. So as I get going, I want to just start with a little bit of background so that I can kind of tell you some of the assumptions that I'm bringing to the table and you can put what I say uh, in context. And to that end, I want to start by acknowledging that I think that we are living in the Anthropocene. So what you're seeing here, starting uh, here on the bottom, uh, is the epics uh, starting at the bottom with the oldest and going up and up and up and up to the top with the current uh, official geologic epoch that we're in the Holocene. Um, and then I, I, oops, I will just add to the top of that uh, the Anthropocene. And just that's to me a way to acknowledge that people have a massive impact on the planet. And I've spent a lot of time recently talking and writing and thinking about how we can have a good Anthropocene, and there's a lot of other people 
uh, working on that uh, as well. And I, I do believe quite firmly that that is possible, even amidst all of the kind of depressing news that we see. And I think that we get there through science, but also through building a kind of empathy with each other um, and with the other species on the planet and with the ecosystems on the, the planet. And so to me, there's a question here about how can we build resilient systems that help people in nature thrive together? And when I say thrive together, I mean because of one another and not like thrive just in spite of uh, one another. So the way I think about this, and this is kind of echoed in a lot of the, the One Earth material that's on your website that I've been reading is, uh, you know, how do we see ecosystems and social ecological systems together? So there's a, a lot of research actually that sort of focuses on that arrow from people to nature. So it might focus on, you know, uh, pollution or uh, land use change or other ways that people are problematic for nature. Um, and similarly, there's quite a lot of work now on the benefits that nature has for people that might be ecosystem services or food or places to recreate. Um, but there's actually very little that looks at the two-way relationship between people and nature. And that's a really important uh, gap and one that I'm always thinking about and trying to fill with the research that I, that I do. So if I put that another way, uh, this is a, a paper or figure from a paper by Georgina Mace. Um, and what she points out is that we've been through a lot of different versions of the way that we think about the human relationship to nature. So in the top in the 1960s and 70s, we might have thought of nature and people as essentially being two separate things. Um, then in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of research about how people are a problem for nature, we're causing extinction, we're threatening species and habitats and polluting places. That shifted again in the early 2000s. Uh, I should say a lot of that research was focused on how we can stop some of those problems. Uh, the early 2000s then, we're now thinking about how ecosystems function and how they benefit people. And what Georgina proposed uh, when this paper came out was that we were moving into a new era uh, uh, focused on resilience and systems that was interdisciplinary and that really focused on uh, the relationship between people uh, and, and nature. So uh, a couple more introductory slides and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into it. But when we're thinking about, uh, about nature, we might look at a picture uh, like this. This one happens to be uh, in Western Canada, but I, I, there are, are not so different landscapes, not all too far from where, uh, where you are right now. We look at a forest like this and we know that it has trees and stores carbon in those trees and in the soil and it harbors biodiversity uh, and all of these things. But we tend to, as scientists, we do one of two things. So we either kind of measure this, so timber, and because our economy is rooted in resources, this is a really important one. We focus on the cheap, reliable, and efficient production of timber from, uh, uh, from forests. Um, and we measure mostly wood in the near term. Uh, or So that's this, the nature to people. Um, and if we're not focused on the, that, if we're focused on the people to nature part, we might look at this and measure, this is showing forest loss in a number of different countries uh, over the time period from about the year 2000 to, to 2013. Uh, and so we might uh, look at this people impact on nature. But what we don't end up capturing is kind of the two-way relationships. Um, and that means that we 
make critically important decisions about the future of resources and landscapes like this one uh, in a kind of isolated piecemeal fashion. Every person with a limited picture of the ecological or the economic or the social risks that are associated with those uh, decisions. And so to me, this all points to a kind of urgent need for new science, something that really integrates across uh, services and sectors and landscapes and time that helps us envision a better future and understand how we can get there. Uh, and before this webinar started, we were just talking about how hard that can be uh, to do. It doesn't sound like it should be, but uh, our systems are very siloed and it, and it is quite hard for people. Okay, so uh, how can we answer stakeholder questions and make inroads towards improving scientific understanding of, of ecosystem services? And, and Canada just a few months ago announced a new $25 million environmental census um, that will be led by the Environmental Data Division of Statistics Canada. And one of our questions in ResNet is, how can we contribute to that? Can we contribute data? Can we contribute knowledge? Can we nudge you towards measuring some of the really important uh, things? So my focus on this kind of research really um, came to a head, really started for me uh, during a project called the Monterigi Connection. And the Monterigi is a, a landscape just outside of Montreal that is uh, agricultural primarily a little bit suburban. Um, and this was a project that we built around working with stakeholders. We met with uh, the uh, dozen or so mayors of the municipalities in this region every four months. We met with their land use planners. We met with their chamber of commerce. We met with farmers um, first to sort of co-design questions and then to come back with answers to the questions that they had. Um, and this is these are the, the sort of questions that they had. So they wanted to know, you know, how are and I've used ES as a shorthand for ecosystem services here. How are they provided by landscapes? You know, where does agricultural food or carbon storage or recreation where does it come from on the the landscape? Um, when do I need nature? to provide those services and when can I rely on technology? So for example, you might think about um, when do I, when can I have clean water by either protecting a, a headwater stream and its forest? And when do I need to instead build a water treatment plant? They wanted to know how provision of services in this region could be resilient to global and regional changes. They know in this region, there's uh, uh, a strong commitment to restoration. They've, they've agreed that they will keep about 30% of the land area in green space, and they need to restore some land to do that. And they wanna know where, which patches should they restore and why? Uh, and then what's the best land use plan now given demands for different services in the future? So those were the kinds of questions uh, that I was hearing as I talked to these stakeholders. And that related to the science that I was doing at that uh, time. So this is a, a figure from that uh, 2015 paper about the, the uh, kind of frontiers of ecosystem service research. And what we were trying to point out was the kind of simple idea that uh, services come from ecosystems uh, gets really complex really quickly when we start talking about the dynamics of the biological system and their interactions with the dynamics of the human system. Uh, and we ultimately identified three key areas of advance. So if I go up here to this top uh, box, this box is all about how ecosystem services, these benefits that come from nature, are really co-produced. So they don't come just from nature, but they come from nature and people acting together. 
And you might think of that as, uh, you know, on a farm, food doesn't just magically sprout from the ground. Somebody needs to plant seeds and plow the ground and fertilize and harvest. Um, and that's true for a lot of services. Um, and we were interested in, in how that worked. I'll spend most of my time on that. But then we also down here were interested in who benefits from those services because benefits aren't spread equally across all people in a landscape. Some people may have more power or more access. And then finally in the middle, these questions of governance. So given the way the social ecological system provides services and the different people who benefit, what are the best practices for governing the landscape for ecosystem services? What sort of decision support tools are, are needed? Okay, so I said I was gonna start up in that top uh, box and spend most of my time there and that's, that's what I'm gonna do. Um, and, and so here, two of the things that we're interested in are really about diversity and heterogeneity. So how, does, how do different dimensions of biodiversity, which might be species diversity or the diversity of different land use types or different ecosystems, how do those influence the benefits that we get from the landscape? Um, and when does that diversity uh, matter? And this was important for helping these managers uh, figure out what green space they needed and where they should restore landscape. So if you think about this, the configuration of a landscape affects the services. So what I mean by that is landscapes are spatially really complex. You might have agricultural fields in some parts and forests in others, maybe some mountains, and the placement of things on the landscape can affect the way the ecosystem functions. Uh, so an example uh, that, that I like and that's relevant to the area where, where you live is the delivery of phosphorus from agricultural fields where it's put as a fertilizer and it runs off and gets into waterways where it's a, a, a pollutant that causes the algae to grow excessively. And we know that a lot more phosphorus gets into the waterway when we don't have any sort of riparian buffer or woodland in between the agricultural area and the, the river. So that's a, an example of how the spatial placement of different land use on the landscape affects an ecosystem service. And so we wanted to understand how that might work for a lot of different ecosystem services in this landscape in the Monterey. So this is Kate Liss who led this work. And this is data by municipality for about 140 municipalities. It's an 11,000 square kilometer area. And we uh, measured how well either composition, so that's just how much of each land use is there? How much agriculture? How much uh, urban land? How much forest? And that's shown here in red. Uh, or how much configuration, and that's the spatial pattern in blue. How much do each of those play a role in our ability to predict the provision of these different ecosystem services uh, down here? And what you see is that there's actually quite a lot of blue on here. So that means that where things are on the landscape really makes a difference. It's not just how much forest is there, it's where that forest is. And that was especially important for things like the value of cottages or water quality or tourism uh, in this region. So once we tried that out at this sort of broad scale, uh, then uh, Jesse Reeb, who uh, was a PhD student in my lab said, I, I wanna try that, but at a really fine resolution. So he mapped seven different ecosystem services and he uh, did that at a 30 meter sp spatial resolution. So he had an, an 
value for the service provided in every 30 meter by 30 meter uh, box on our landscape. And I'll just show you a little bit of what those uh, look like. So, um, you know, here's agriculture up here uh, and, and the yellows are, are areas where we're producing more food and the red where we're producing less. Uh, and here's carbon storage down here. So this is out here is where the forests are. The city of Montreal where I live is sort of in, uh, in this region. And the forests are generally as you get farther away from uh, Montreal. A lot of the recreation happens close, no surprise. People don't wanna travel uh, all that far to recreate. Uh, and for us, deer hunting happens kind of at the edge of where the agriculture meets the forest. So once Jesse uh, was able to map those services, he then looked at different classes of configuration on the, the landscape. So, um, uh, let me, let me talk in a little bit of detail about how we did that because it'll make a little bit more sense. So he mapped for every one of those 30 meter pixels, how close is it to the edge of this patch? So you could imagine a, a, a piece of forest that's in the center of a big forest patch or one that's right at the edge. He mapped uh, how diverse those patches of landscape were and how connected they were or how close they are to other patches of, uh, of similar types. And if we take sort of the four extremes, we end up with four different kinds of, uh, of landscapes. And we can map those right back onto our Monteregi. So we have, uh, for example, in the dark blue, we have uh, edges of, uh, um, of highly connected landscapes. Or in the maroon, we have edges of very uh, non-diverse landscapes. So we're able to map those back. And then we're able to take a sort of finer scale look at um, what's going on with uh, landscape configuration and ecosystem services. Uh, so I'm showing here the relationship between services. So for example, this first one is the relationship between deer hunting and maple syrup. And what I want you to notice, and this line is zero indicating that there's no relationship, is that sometimes there's a positive relationship between deer hunting and maple syrup, meaning where I get more deer hunting on the landscape, I'm also going to produce more maple syrup. And in other kinds of landscapes, there's a trade-off, meaning where I have more deer hunting, I get less maple syrup. And that was really interesting to us because it meant that not only did configuration tell us where services were produced, it was actually influencing the relationships between different services on the, the landscape. And of all the, the the comparisons we made, 20 of 21 of them showed a statistically significant variation. So there was a lot of influence of configuration on these uh, relationships. So we found here from this little part that configuration, the spatial pattern of land use, it influenced just individual services and their interactions. Um, and no one type of configuration led to more positive or fewer negative interactions overall. So that complicates matters for these landscape managers. They really have to think about what's going on on the landscape in some detail beyond just the immediate impacts of, uh, of land use change. So what we're doing with that now is sort of modeling the future outcomes of restoration. So we know that this landscape is about to be, uh, uh, large portions of it are about to be restored. Probably that'll be about 17% of the landscape, but it might be, let's say half of that 8% or, or a very low amount. And then we were curious about uh, whether if you restored that landscape at random, would that provide different ecosystem services from if you focused on abandoned agricultural fields or degraded agricultural fields? 
Uh, and this work that's being done right now by, by Catherine de Tromp uh, is basically filling in each of these boxes with a map for different services. So I'll show you just the, the agricultural map. So this is uh, uh, with 2% restoration, 8% restoration and 17% restoration. And so here the agricultural production, when it's yellow or red, it's more agriculture uh, and those purples show less agriculture. And Catherine's now working on building models that will allow us to do that uh, for six ecosystem services in total. So we'll be able to get back to our, our stakeholders, our decision makers, a lot of useful information about why it matters where they restore this landscape and, and what they can do about it. Okay, so uh, a couple of other things that we're working on uh, in, in ResNet. So one is uh, path dependence and legacy. So what is it about history that affects the provision of ecosystem uh, services? I talked so far about space and interactions across space. And now I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing um, uh, through time. Uh, and this is work that's being done uh, actually on the west coast of Canada. It's being led by Anne Salomon at Simon Fraser University, and she is working uh, with nine uh, First Nations groups in British Columbia that are called the Coastal First Nations Great Bear Initiative. And the, the situation that they came to us with was that commercial harvest and climate induced declines. And then the recovery of predators like otters were really constraining the coastal indigenous communities access to fisheries for food and for economic development. Uh, and so here, the questions Anne's trying to answer are not just about uh, the spatial configuration of land use, but about how the historical dynamics between otters and kelp and sea urchins, and now the influence of climate change is changing services and how we might uh, think about uh, management in light of all of those things. Um, and then one last challenge up in that top uh, box that I wanted to talk about is the role of social systems in ecosystem service supply. And I mentioned this question of when do we need nature and when can we substitute for nature with uh, technology or other human interventions to get what we need off of the, the landscape. Um, and for ResNet, the, the landscape that's working on this the most, or a good example of it, uh, is happening over here on the east coast of Canada in the Bay of Fundy. Um, and this is a really interesting challenge. So here in this sort of gray are dikelands. And there are, uh, I believe, almost 100 kilometers of dikelands in this area. And what those dikelands are doing is holding back the sea uh, from encroaching on what is now agriculture. And those dikes have been there uh, basically since the first European settlers came to this uh, region hundreds of years ago. And right now the Department of Agriculture can't afford to continue to maintain them for a variety of reasons, including climate change that's raising sea level, they need to uh, basically divest from some of them. And the question that they have for us is, well, which, which ones? Um, and this presents a really interesting challenge because those dikelands, and this is one of the, the, the dikes with this girl out biking, um, uh, there are different uses that people make of the dikelands where they might go biking or hunting or that are providing flood control versus if we let those go, they'll be replaced by salt marshes, which have some flood attenuation and some different kinds of hunting. Uh, and that makes a really interesting question about what to do and where to maintain dikes and where to let them go. 
Uh, and this is very complicated, so I'll just say this is uh, that group's initial look at how the dikelins and the wetlands combined with human actions and natural processes lead to different sets of ecosystem services. And they're now working on uh, quantifying those uh, so that we can get a better understanding and get back to the Department of Agriculture uh, with some answers. Okay, Let's, we'll skip through the Northwest Territories there. We can come back to that during questions if we want. Um, and just say, so I've, I've introduced you a little bit to this managing Pacific coastal fisheries uh, and also this Bay of Fundy uh, dikeland futures. Um, but we also have landscapes in Quebec and in the Northwest Territories, in the prairies and in uh, BC and Alberta. And one uh, other interesting thing that we're trying to do, interesting to me, um, is to figure out how to take all of that uh, knowledge that we're generating in those landscapes and build some sort of multi-scalar uh, monitoring system. Uh, so in my head, that looks something like this, where we have uh, ecosystem service knowledge and data that's being generated in these landscapes. And that is kind of fed upwards. And at the same time, ResNet has three thematic groups. Uh, and those themes are responsible for trying to understand and make sense of knowledge across the landscape. So for example, uh, theme one here is thinking about the decision space and how decisions are being made in the landscapes. Theme two is thinking about modeling and theme three is thinking about monitoring. And they're really working across the different uh, landscapes. And then that all comes together uh, through the synthesis team that is then really building uh, what we've been calling ESON-C that stands for the Ecosystem Services Observatory Network of Canada. And that's really our goal is to try to help Canada with its environmental census by building this tool that will let us uh, assess ecosystem services at this large scale. Um, let me talk just a little bit about the themes uh, to show you how that uh, work is, is happening. Uh, so in theme two, which is that modeling theme, uh, we're really moving beyond uh, trade-offs and synergies to more sophisticated relationships. Uh, and you can see here that in this first work that they're doing, they're working with uh, Landscape 6 and the sea otters and the uh, crab, abalone, and urchin populations to try to build models that help understand in a little bit more subtle way who's benefiting from uh, the, the different services that are being uh, uh, produced in that, uh, that region. So we're down here now in this uh, benefits challenge area, and we're thinking about the diversity of stakeholders. So the First Nations stakeholders and their benefits versus the commercial fishery stakeholders and their benefits and how preferences play a role uh, there. And similarly, we have a theme working on, on monitoring and they are building these statistical belief network models that help us to detect unintended effects of human activities. And they're working again in this Monteregie. So this is sort of the uh, uh, Southern part of Quebec where maple syrup is a really big product for us and trying to understand how climate change combined with uh, people's demand for maple syrup uh, influences production. Okay, um, so I have one last thing to talk about and then I'm gonna stop and leave some time for us to, to chat and have questions. Um, but I wanna just talk a little bit about this scaling up because there are a lot of values of uh, doing work at a local scale because we can be more transdisciplinary. We can engage local actors, we can fit the research to real questions that people are asking. That knowledge is more likely to be taken up. 
that motivates action, it amplifies missing voices, and all of these things are, uh, are really uh, important on the, the landscape um, and cross-disciplinarity, this transdisciplinarity. Um, but one of the big questions is, can we scale that up? Can we say something about what's happening across, uh, across a whole country and really build some sort of uh, observatory network. Um, and there are a lot of challenges to uh, doing that. So, you know, one question is this question of transferability. You know, how relevant is it if I study maple syrup in Quebec? How relevant is that to what's happening in a different sort of agricultural landscape? You know, probably not so relevant to where you are, for example. Um, how do we make sure that we have the infrastructure for uh, sharing? That actually takes a lot of time and we're, everybody's busy just sort of keeping their own things going and doing their own jobs. So how do we make sure that we've left enough space for the time that it takes to share and talk? How do we identify representative cases? Um, and uh, know which ones are gonna help us scale? How do we incorporate different knowledge systems like indigenous knowledge? How do we align timescales and priorities? And then how do we deal with the sort of power relations uh, and shifting dynamics that can happen between different groups? And it turns out for each of these challenges, there are solutions in the literature and ResNet has thought a little bit about how we're gonna handle them. So for example, for this issue of transferability, one idea is to use theory around similarities as a kind of lending library. And so we in ResNet have spent a lot of time building a common framework around ecosystem services and trade-offs, trust and empathy. Uh, and we're hoping that that's gonna help us with this issue of transferability. Um, we have the synthesis team that's working on making sure that we have space for sharing. I can tell you quite honestly, even with that team, it is still really hard to make sure that we have enough time for that and enough uh, energy and space and funding. Um, for identifying representative cases, we have this common focus on trade-offs and on working landscapes. Uh, we're working hard to think about how to generalize the importance of traditional ecological knowledge or tech um, and how to make sure that we're representing that knowledge at all scales. Uh, aligning time scales and priorities is really hard, um, but we are working with stakeholders from the very beginning and we are aware of the different mandates and objectives of our different actors at different scales. And we're working hard to be uh, transparent about those and invest in teamwork, even uh, when it sometimes sacrifices some of our short-term uh, uh, productivity. Uh, and then shifting power dynamics. And that's really about getting actors working together early in the process. And uh, we've been trying to do that with multi-actor uh, multi -actor workshops. We're a little bit stymied because we only started a few months before COVID, and that has made getting everybody together a little bit uh, harder than it might otherwise be. Okay, so I just have a couple slides left, and uh, I wanted to walk through uh, this framework, this is the framework that we're using as our commonality. Um, and uh, I'll just walk through it. Um, so what it shows basically is that we have landscapes that produce different sets of ecosystem services. Those influence people's, different people's quality of life. That quality of life then influences our decisions about when to use technology and when to use natural capital on our landscapes to produce ecosystem services. Um, and what I like about it is that it's quite simple actually, and it focuses in on four things. So we have nature in the top left, we have people in the bottom right, and then we have the things that connect them, ecosystem services and, uh, and decisions. And so to me, what this framework does is help ensure that in ResNet, we're walking our way all the way around that 
uh, uh, that circle uh, of people in nature interacting. Um, so I wanted to introduce you to, to ResNet, this new pan-Canadian network that's designed to address uh, multi-scale issues around ecosystem services. And I wanted to talk about uh, our main goals, the sort of how can we answer local stakeholder questions, use what we're doing answering those questions to advance this place-based transdisciplinary science, how do we make inroads into improving scientific understanding of services? And then how do we use all of that to uh, contribute to the, a monitoring system for Canada? Um, I hope that I've gotten through all of those uh, a little bit quickly perhaps, but I really wanted to leave time for uh, questions and conversation. We have a huge number of different partners who play a role in this. So there's a lot of universities involved. We now, we started, I think, with about 24 people, and we're now up to a network of close to 150. Um, we have a lot of partners who are either helping provide technology or using the results that we uh, are producing uh, in ResNet. Uh, and then at the very bottom, NSERC, which is our, our primary funder uh, in all of this. So I will thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing so that I can see what's going on here. Um, and then maybe I will hand it back over and um, you can tell me how you want to handle uh, questions and conversation. Yes, please, everybody, put your questions into the Q&A box. It should be at the bottom of, of your screen. Uh, as those come in, uh, if you would like, Dr. Bennett, I will ask those uh, and try to get things going a little bit. And so we have one from Olivia right now, and it's ResNet sounds like a truly revolutionary and important venture that requires a collaboration and participation of so many different opinions, lifestyles, and priorities. People are a vital part of the system of things, one health, with an exclamation point, but differing opinions about nature, wildlife, and ecosystem services can make progress difficult. Have you received any kind of pushback as a result of this? If so, how did you address it? Wow, that is a fabulous question. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and yeah, I, I think this is, that, that to me is, it's really at the cutting edge. And I think it's really important. Um, I can see already that I'm avoiding answering the question, but I'm gonna avoid answering it for a little bit longer because I wanna say, I, I think that something that happens. So what, when I look out and, and in some of my good Anthropocene's work where I'm looking at what are people doing to change the world around them, you know, when you're trying to change the world, it's like you've got a piece of the rope and you're tugging on it in one direction. But if somebody else is tugging in the opposite direction, then you, you end up sort of going nowhere. And so if we're all, if we have different values or different beliefs about how to make the world better, um, you know, just let's just start with the happy assumption that everyone's trying to make the world better. But if you have a different belief, then we might be either competing for resources or, um, or actively, you know, pulling in different directions. And I think that's this part in your question about the different opinions about nature and wildlife and where we should go. So, you know, you might think that it's really important on this landscape. It's, it's a corn producing landscape and we need to make sure that it continues to produce corn. And I might think, gosh, I don't know, you know, people aren't eating as much corn anymore. It's really important that we um, uh, think about restoring and carbon storage. That's going to be the, the most important ecosystem service going forward. Those are really hard uh, uh, questions to answer. And so um, one of the, the ways that we do that is we actually get all of these different participants in the room together to either uh, talk about the landscape as it is, or to build scenarios of the future 
and talk about what they want from the future. And that often just gets people a little bit out of their, the things that they usually argue about and into a space where they can argue about the deeper values. And, you know, we don't always solve that, that issue, but we do sometimes get people at least to address and acknowledge, oh, my, what I want from this landscape is different from what you want. We need to figure out a way to talk about that or come to a compromise. That's a great question. And uh, in the chat from Casey, we had, if you had to sum up ResNet in one or two sentences in trying to educate others, what would it be? <laughs> That's another good question. And my answer to that, I think, would probably change uh, depending on what part of ResNet I'm working on. But I, I think of it as, you know, it's a pan-Canadian network that is made up of a, a series of um, a group of scientists working in a series of working landscapes to understand how social ecological systems work, basically. And from Michelle, we have uh, how much attention is given to the unfortunate reality of illicit trade in your framework? Example, mm -hmm. corrupt officials, illicit farmland conversion, or illegal logging? Um, so good question. I mean, and explicitly, I think the answer is really none, um, which maybe points out that my framework is, you know, works better in a Canadian context where there's maybe a little less of that than it might in another context. And I'm trying to think if it could be, there, there is, I didn't talk too much about this, but in that framework, there's a section of that outside the main circle where we show how services can move, right? Some services like agricultural production, you put it in a box and send it away to somewhere else. And other services don't move like recreation. I can't box that up and send it somewhere else. So I'm, I'm trying to think about whether you could think about that arrow of moving. That's where that illicit trade comes in and whether you could sort of expand that out and build in there. But I don't think we're explicitly doing that. Um, and, and maybe we should. Danielle asks, is there a particular landscape or system that fascinates you the most? So for me, I think it's agriculture. Um, yeah, I think it's agriculture. There's probably a couple reasons for that. Um, uh, some of it is, um, I'm from, my family's from uh, actually uh, not too far from where you all are in, in Pennsylvania around the Lancaster area. And so some of it's just, well, that's the landscape I grew up with. Um, and some of it is that to me is where people and nature come together. And I know most, I don't know if it's most ecologists, many ecologists are drawn to kind of you know, the wilderness or the rugged or the, you know, really remote. Um, and those places are certainly beautiful, but to me, maybe because of my interest in how people and nature get along, that really happens in these agricultural landscapes. That's where it's, where all the complexity is. And so to me, that's where it's most interesting. Uh, Eric asks, what is your strategy for expanding and improving ecosystem services in areas that have been heavily developed by humans? Wow, y'all are hitting me with the good questions tonight. <laughs> These are great. Um, uh, I just, I'm so tempted to like write them down so I can come back and think about them. I'll have to just store them away for now. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, in some ways, the reason that we're heavily developing these landscapes is to get particular services, right? So it's often to kind of intensify agriculture and make that production really efficient or um, to really get a lot of timber. Um, and what that's done is kind of ignore some of the other services that are being produced in those landscapes. And that's for a long time has been a focus of my research is just kind of educating 
other scientists and people in general about those trade-offs, helping people see like, hey, you, it's not cost-free to develop this landscape so heavily. You might be getting one thing, but you're giving up other things and those other things are of value. At that point, I, then the decision kind of gets turned over to these decision makers about, well, what do you want to do about that? Because that feels to me like that's no longer a scientific question. That's a question about community values. And the, the question before that came up about when people have different values, then that community needs to sort of dig in and say, okay, we built these scenarios. Here's the you know, here's three different options or a range of options of what we can get. Do we really want a landscape that, you know, the only thing that it does is make a lot of corn or do we want something else off of this landscape? And if so, then I can provide some of the information about how to configure the landscape and what, you know, what amounts and pattern of land use they can use to try to get what it is that they want. And from Claire, we have, has ResNet proposed a combination of services, uses of the land that the stakeholders refused? I'm curious if the officials have had any point, at any point have gone against the scientific advice for the best balance. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, <laughs> less I think going against advice because we do try really hard not to say like, all right, this is the right direction, but rather to say, this is your menu of, of options. But there are for sure times that the managers in these landscapes kind of say, well, yeah, you know, I know you're telling me that I should do, you know, try to get more diversity going on in this landscape, or, you know, that that would benefit a bigger diversity or bigger group of, of my stakeholders. But, you know, and then the but, you know, dot, dot, dot. And then it's usually these, this group of stakeholders is much more powerful. And so I need to do what they want. And so, you know, those decisions end up being, being out of our hands, but there are for sure times when power or money or other things kind of lead a, a landscape off in a direction that I wish that it wasn't going, but I, do you think ResNet has a role to play and anybody doing this kind of work has a role to play then because we can bring at least some science and some legitimacy to a process to help people have those conversations? We're pretty much at the end of our time, but I have another question. Uh, I'm really curious, uh, looking at these projects across the breadth of Canada, and that this is happening at a national level. In the United States, I could just see states' rights coming into play and that tr any kind of attempt by the national government to come up with a, a kind of a broader view of things would be met with a lot of resistance. Do you see that at a provincial level? Um. Yes and no. I think not nearly to the extent that it's happening in the United States. Um, uh, we do see it some, you know, especially some of the provinces like Alberta or Quebec, where I am, that, you know, are a little bit more likely to push back against uh, uh, federal government. And, and we do see that some. Um, but not as much, although I will say that the, for us in Canada, the way a lot of the resource management is set up, that runs through the provinces. Um, but interestingly, that creates a lot of problems because you've got, you know, Quebec is off doing its own thing. And then right next door, Ontario is doing its own thing. And so you get these spatial disconnects that um, make management really complicated. I can imagine. I can imagine. And, and if I may, just one other question. And that's related to value structures and, and looking at values for ecosystem services versus what I'm going to benefit from right now. Um, 
I'm curious about how you get people to really look at that future value. Uh, and in that looking at future value, is there some kind of modeling to look at, you know, maybe what the future may look like uh, from the standpoint of climate change and, and other things in, in developing strategies? Yeah, that's a good question. And I don't, I don't know that I have the answer to that, although I can say that the scenario development work that I've done, I can see that when that has an influence. So it, when we, we did scenario development and I didn't, we had these great artist images that were done for the Monteregie. And I just remember, you know, a few people in the room, like the, the woman who was the representative from the Chamber of Commerce, who was all the time pushing, you know, development and suburbanization and increase the tax base. And then, you know, when she saw the scenario outcome of that, she was like, oh, well, that wasn't what I wanted. I lost a whole bunch of forests. And it just, she just kind of hadn't connected the dots that yeah. that was what was going to happen. And the same thing happened for almost everybody had a favorite, including me, right? You go in and you're like, oh, I really like this one that's like really green. And then you kind of go, oh, but I put a bunch of farmers out of business. And so everybody had this little bit of aha moment that I feel like maybe it didn't all the way shift our values, but it, it at least kind of opened the door to that being a possibility. So I, I'm looking forward to doing more of that with the ResNet landscapes. Yeah, I think that the, the GIS and being able to visualize modeling is, is probably gonna be extremely valuable in that decision-making. Great. Thank you so much. This has been fascinating. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm sure that our audience has thoroughly enjoyed it as well. Some great questions from everybody. Just a reminder by Claire uh, from our library who has done ex an amazing job of pulling together information to kind of support uh, not only our seminars, but to encourage you to learn more. Uh, we've got information for you. So go to library.delval.edu forward slash uh, one help, one word. Uh, Going to be information there for you. Uh, I've been trying to jot down many of the references you've been talking about, Dr. Bennett. Uh, I'm going to be digging those up. So uh, students, if you're looking for information, Claire can help you. We'll try to help you out as much as possible. Excellent. And feel free to be in touch if you missed anything or I can send things your way or students way. I'm, I'm always happy to do that. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you all and have a Thank wonderful you. night. That's been great. Thank you so Good much. Good night, everybody. Good night.